It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the first um, institute lecture for this calendar year. Happens to be very early in the semester as well. Um, and it's especially a great pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Subir Sachdev, who is the Herschel Smith Professor of Physics at Harvard University. And he presently holds the Raman Chair of the Indian Academy of Sciences. So, Professor Subir Sachdev has been at Harvard since uh, 2005. He is a condensed matter physicist. Uh, he started his academic career at Yale University and spent about 18 years there, um, where he did a lot of work on antiferromagnets and um, I think he had an interest in high TC superconductivity, which has been an abiding interest from what I understand. If you get the impression that I know all of this, no, I don't. Uh, it's just that I have to appear literate, uh, so that's what it is. Um, yes, this was subsequent to a PhD which he did at Harvard University under the supervision of David Nelson where he was doing classical statistical physics. Um, and for the youngsters, the undergraduate students here, I should also tell you that in 1982, his undergraduate thesis got him the Leroy Apker Award of the American Physical Society for outstanding research as an undergraduate student with potential for uh, research. And uh, as one of his formative influences, this work was done by, with Daniel Kleppner at MIT. Uh, he then moved across the street to Harvard to get his PhD. Uh, and for those of us here, uh, the local language, uh, in 1978, he was GE rank number two. Uh, and I should also add, in the, those years, you could take your exam when you were in class 11, and he cleared this when he was in class 11, which means that he skipped a year. But he didn't stay long, he stayed a year, and then he, when his family moved to Washington, I understand that he moved to MIT. He transferred to MIT and got his undergraduate in three years and his PhD in three years as well. Recently, he has been interested in uh, the marriage of string theory and condensed matter physics. And I can read for you something which has then cross-fertilized into going back into, uh, into string theory. And one of the people who researches in this had this to say. A lot of us got into this field because of the force of Subir's personality and his reputation. We realized that if he was taking this seriously, maybe we should too. Uh, in addition to the Leroy Apker Award, he was awarded with the Lars von Sager Prize of the American Physical Society. He has won Dirac Prizes of both the UNSW and ICTP, and he was the Yulio Rakha uh, Memorial Lecturer in 2021 of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So without much further ado then, um, may I welcome Professor Subz. So be such a to talk about the topic that is there on this screen. Well, oh, thank you very much, uh, Dean, for that very kind introduction. There was only one thing you didn't mention. Uh, in 1978, I came to IIT Delhi, <laughs> and I spent it in Nilguri Hostel which is still there, but looks much nicer today. Uh, we used to have what, we, what uh, my friends call bulletproof chapatis, but I think <laughs> hopefully the food is much better there today. <laughs> uh, okay, but so it's really a great pleasure to be back at IIT Delhi. Uh, I see the, some buildings look very familiar, but everything else is totally transformed. I think this lecture hall was there, but it wasn't as nice. Uh, and uh, I remember hearing many interesting lectures over here. So, okay, so let's get started. Um, so, most the first half of the lecture will be a fairly 
elementary level, giving what I remember of the standard of the, my fellow students at IIT Delhi. So just bear with me as I talk about some elementary things. So what I thought I'm, I'm going to do is talk about, give you a history of four basic ideas in physics, uh, when they were discovered. And some of these ideas and discoveries have had an impact uh, and lead to questions that are still open today. Uh, and then in the second part of my lecture, um, I will talk about you know, the recent developments which will connect all these seemingly different topics together. <coughs> so first, let's begin in 1870, which is uh, with a concept that will play a central role in my subsequent discussion. Uh, what is entropy and what is temperature? So entropy and temperature were uh, discovered as concepts by engineers trying to build engines. In, the, in 1865, uh, Clausius formulated the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which basically said that uh, there are no perpetual motion machines. Uh, I think you've all seen The Simpsons, and this is a perpetual motion machine. At least for Simpsons, you can do it, uh, built by uh, Homer Simpson's daughter. Anyway, so what Clausius said that every object has a quantity called entropy, and this entropy has to always increase. Uh, and this implied the fact that there were no perpetual motion machines. So that's a very general concept, having nothing to do with the microscopic <coughs> constituents of matter. Um, and, it, uh, and also temperature was also kind of an arbitrary concept, something measured on, uh, on some scale with, as of mercury as it heats up and gives you a value of the temperature in degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit or whatever. Okay, uh, so the Great Revolution occurred in 1870 uh, when Boltzmann uh, gave a microscopic interpretation of what entropy is. Uh, and, and remember, in 1870, even the existence of molecules and atoms were not fully established, uh, but Boltzmann firmly believed in it. Uh, and then he equate, equated entropy, called S, uh, KB is Boltzmann's constant, and W is a measure of the randomness, uh, some measurement you can define, uh, of the molecules, say, uh, of the gas in the room. Uh, and from this you know, remarkable connection between the macroscopic property called entropy and the microscopic property called W, uh, Boltzmann could then de re-derive all of thermodynamics uh, and even time-dependent properties of gases from, from using Newton's laws, essentially. So this is uh, Boltzmann's grave in uh, Vienna, uh, and there's one of the most famous equations in physics, <laughs> S equals K log W. Uh, and then also with, in the connection to thermodynamics, uh, we came up with an absolute definition of what is temperature. It's just the rate of change of entropy uh, with the energy of a system. Uh, for the experts, this would be in the microcanonical ensemble. All right, so that's, uh, the connections to entropy. So now let's talk about the second great discovery, uh, which was 1911, the superconductivity. Uh, and it, this is a great, you know, the, the progress in superconductivity has continued since then and leaves many open questions that are still present today. So what is a superconductor? Well, anyway, so uh, a conductor conducts electricity. A semiconductor doesn't conduct it so well. Uh, well, okay, no. Uh, so it's a, an ordinary conductor is like copper, and we can understand uh, the motion of current in copper by just imagining that there are a bunch of electrons which have been decoupled from their parent atoms and are free to move through the wire. Now these electrons repel each other and they have a lot of correlations, but for the most part you can ignore it uh, and this theory of electrons moving in copper wires is really the foundation of the entire electronic industry. All right, so superconductivity is a quite a different beast. It was discovered way back in 1911 uh, when Camerlionis uh, in Leiden cooled uh, mercury down to uh, minus 269 degrees centigrade, uh, which is I think four degrees Kelvin or something like that, uh, and uh, showed that in fact it started to conduct electricity uh, uh, without any resistance at all. So this was a, a remarkable discovery, uh, and many people tried their hand to try to understand it. Uh, and it wasn't really understood, even in mercury, 
until 1957 and the famous BCS theory, which I won't say much more about. Okay. But really another great discovery in superconductivity happened in 1986 uh, with the discovery of a whole new class of superconductors, which are sometimes called the cuprate high temperature superconductors. High temperature because they become superconductors uh, already at the boiling point of liquid nitrogen, which is 77 degrees Kelvin, so much higher than, than mercury. Uh, and here's a little piece of yttrium barium copper oxide, or YBCO as we call it. Uh, it has a rather complicated crystal structure, and I'll say a bit more about uh, this crystal a bit later. But if you take a little pellet of YBCO, and you dip it in liquid nitrogen, uh, and then here's that pellet, which has been dipped in liquid nitrogen. Uh, this, is a race, this is a tract of magnets, ordinary magnets. Uh, and then you can see that it floats above until, well, it heats up, and then it's no longer a superconductor. Uh, and so the reason this happened is that uh, the ability of a superconductor to pass current without resistance uh, allows it to create just the right magnetic fields uh, so that it can float above uh, uh, a set of permanent magnets. So that also points to one of the, you know, so this is quite an amazing thing to have something that can uh, have a lot of current flowing in it uh, without any resistance, and it's especially useful when you want to create large magnetic fields. So superconductors are already used in, uh, in MRI machines, so when they do a scan of your, of your brain or the rest of your body. Uh, but one of the most promising uses, which could really change our world, uh, is the use in fusion energy. So this HDS magnets uh, is short for high temperature superconducting magnets. Uh, and YBCO is in fact the playing the starting role. Uh, and YBCO is here. This is now no longer a pellet, but drawn into wires. So now the technology exists to make large, long wires of YBCO. And so this can create a very strong magnetic field in this cavity uh, where you put in a plasma of, of neutrons, protons, and deuterons, and so on. Uh, and maybe you get fusion energy from that confined plasma uh, of these nuclei. So there's a company in, in Boston, and there's several others around the world trying to use uh, YBCO uh, to get fusion energy uh, in, a, in, in a relatively small uh, Set up. So this works, you know, my, my life's work on YBCO and other materials would have been worth it because this could really uh, transform things. Anyway, so that's one of the most exciting uh, technological applications, but that's not the reason really that I've been fascinated by them. Uh, the reason I'm fascinated by the superconductors, we still don't understand completely why they go superconducting at a relatively high temperature. So here's a, what we call a phase diagram uh, as a function of temperature and uh, hole <coughs> doping, or this is really the density of electrons. So what you do is you take this, this crystal and you keep changing the concentration of oxygen uh, and changing x moves you along this axis. So what you see is there's a certain density of electrons uh, where the critical temperature for a superconductor is nearly 100 Kelvin. Uh, so we'd like to know why, is, why did it go superconducting in 100 Kelvin? Could we make a material that went superconducting, say, at room temperature, 300 Kelvin? That would really you know, have a revolutionary impact. So, so people have been studying a lot what happens when you heat this material up. Uh, and there, therein lies one of the big mysteries. So, so this blue, bluish-red region up here, you have basically a metal. And if you study the metal over here at high hole doping, uh, then you see a metal that looks rather like copper, where the individual electrons can be just viewed as independent of each other. Uh, but in the middle, we have this, for want of a better word, something called a strange metal, because many of its properties uh, don't look like those of copper. So this isn't this, you know, if you want to know more about details of those properties, uh, that's, you know, you can come talk to me tomorrow or something. Uh, there's a lot is known about the strange metal, uh, and one of the, you know, one such property is the fact that its resistance at very low temperatures is a linear function of temperature, uh, the resistivity, and then it goes to zero here, indicating the onset of superconductivity. Um, 
And copper would never show such a long region of linear resistivity um, at these low temperatures. So, so that's in fact one of the problems that I've been very much focused on, trying to understand the strange metal. What are the electrons actually doing in this metal? Uh, and, uh, and so once we understand the strange metal, we can go then backwards and understand why it goes superconducting at a high temperature, uh, and maybe even someday build a better superconductor. Okay, so that's it for superconductivity for now. I'll come back to those open problems a bit later. Uh, now I'm going to tell you about another set of open problems. Uh, and you wonder why. And really, I knew nothing about black holes when I was working on superconductivity. Uh, but one of the amazing things, and a lucky accident in my life, uh, is that somehow I work on superconductivity taught us something about black holes. And that connection is something I want to give you a flavor of in my talk. <coughs> All right, so black holes uh, were discovered, at least theoretically, in one of the great triumphs of theoretical physics in 1916 by Carl Schwarzschild, uh, who died soon after in World War I. So he never got to see his celebrated discovery uh, really change physics. <coughs> So what Carl Schwarzschild was doing was solving Einstein's theory of gravitation, what we call general relativity, uh, under conditions uh, where you had a very dense mass M. So imagine there's some, you take a mass M uh, and you make it extremely small, and then you ask outside, you know, what does the gravitational field look like? Uh, well, you know, for the Earth, it's just, or the Sun, it's just Newton's laws good enough, but if the mass is really dense, uh, then the gravitational field changes completely. Uh, and what he found was that the, if the mass was compressed below a radius called r, which is now called the Schwarzschild radius, which is given by this expression where g is Newton's constant of gravitation and c is the velocity of light, then the, then the gravitational attraction would be so, so intense that even light cannot escape. So you know, if an atom in here uh, emitted light, the light would bend backwards and be attracted by the gravitation. Uh, and, and so anything inside this horizon, as it's called, is forever lost to the outside universe. So before you get worried about this, and most people didn't when, they, when this was written, uh, it's good to appreciate what this radius r is. If you put m, the Earth's mass, then r is the size of a p. So you would have to compress the entire Earth to the size of a p. Uh, to get a black hole. Uh, okay, so, so that's, that's how dense matter would have to be for black holes to exist in the universe. Uh, but in fact, it's even much worse. If you continue to apply, you know, imagine there's a mass that's <laughs> collapsing because of gravitational attraction, uh, and then it get, becomes smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. Well, Einstein's theory says it doesn't stop there. It keeps going. Uh, the attraction is still acting. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, what Einstein's theory would say that right at the center of a black hole, uh, there's a matter of infinite density. Uh, it's all empty space everywhere, and all the matter is right at the center. That's what would be the fate of a matter, something that collapsed uh, to, to, down to the Schwarzschild radius. So, you know, so people just uh, they took it, this, decided this couldn't possibly happen. Uh, it couldn't be such, this is totally unphysical. You can't apply Einstein's equations at such densities. Uh, and so, I mean, Schwarzschild work was pretty much ignored for quite a while. But it just didn't seem reasonable. It wasn't until much later, by the work of Chandrasekhar and Oppenheimer, that slowly the th uh, theoretical realization came that this could actually happen, that matter could behave in a strange way, and black holes would form. Uh, today, you know, black holes are everywhere. For instance, there's a black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It's a supermassive black hole, uh, which contains about 4.3 million suns. That's how heavy it is. Uh, and so then the Schwarzschild radius is quite big. It's not the size of a P. It's about the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, and this is a picture from the Event Horizon Telescope just last year, you know, showing this black hole. Uh, there's very little doubt that there's a black hole in here, uh, and it's not just at the center of the Milky Way, but the center of every galaxy seems to have a supermassive black hole. 
There are also many other black holes which are not as massive, uh, which are detected by the LIGO telescope, so which there's going to be one in India soon. Uh, so they're there, and they're very much part of the universe. Uh, so now we can no longer really ignore them, and they have to. The theory of black holes has to be unified with our, you know, the whole theory of everything else in the universe. Um, so, all right, to so go back to the singularity then, uh, which uh, seemed unphysical. So, so what people realized fairly early on, uh, that the quantum theory should, that to understand this collapsed matter at the center of the black hole, you certainly couldn't use uh, Einstein's theory. Furthermore, you had to use quantum theory, quantum theory that was developed for how an electron moves around a neutron, a proton, excuse me, in a hydrogen atom, should, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle should all come into play to understand what's happening at the center of the black hole. Uh, all right. So, so, th so, so that's, you know, that idea stood around for a while. And the first person really to seriously think about the effects of quantum effects of black holes uh, was Hawking. And what, you know, Hawking made, made a very brilliant calculation which sidestepped all the difficulties of what's happening inside the black hole. He was the first to realize that even sitting outside a black hole, if you were an observer far away from the black hole, safe from the collapsing to the center, you could still see in principle some quantum effects. Uh, and outside the black hole, space-time is rather smooth, and so you can do a theory of what's going on. And he gave some very general argument, and you know this connects to the first part of my talk, that black holes, like any other thermodynamic object, uh, have an entropy and a temperature. And they, in fact, slowly evaporate, uh, like, a, you know, like a cup of coffee, uh, and cool down and, and, uh, and lose all their matter. Uh, and furthermore, with this shocking discovery, you give an actual value for the temperature, which is now called the Hawking temperature of a black hole, which involves things I've already <laughs> introduced, the Newton's gravitational constant, the mass that's inside the black hole, Boltzmann's constant, see suddenly now Boltzmann constant's coming in, the velocity of light, and h-bar uh, that I haven't introduced yet, uh, that's Planck's constant, of course, which determines the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. Uh, this is a picture of, of Hawking's uh, grave in Westminster Abbey in London. Uh, here lies what was a model of Stephen Hawking, and there's the Hawking formula. So another famous formula in physics uh, on a gravestone. Um, I actually was in London this past year, and I wanted to go take a picture myself uh, of this grave, but uh, the line was too long, so I had to leave. <laughs> I think closed before I could get it. Anyway. All right, so that's topic number three, just a gentle introduction to black holes. And now I'm going to introduce, go seriously into quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement. Um, and this is going to be the new idea that's going to tie together uh, the very basic open problems we talked about you know, in superconductivity. Why do some materials go superconducting at rather high temperatures? And for black holes, you know, what is this Hawking temperature and what is really happening inside the black hole, which is something that Hawking said nothing about. He was, as I'll explain, was able to say that just looking from the outside. So now I've introduced, this is the fourth uh, history lesson, or physics lesson. Uh, what is quantum entanglement? Uh, now we moved up to 1935. All right, so, uh, well, so first I have to give you a lightning introduction to quantum mechanics itself. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Schrodinger's cat, which is both alive and dead. Uh, anyway, so yes, that's possible uh, in principle, but you would have to isolate the cat from the rest of the universe. Uh, and so the cat wouldn't be able to breathe, so it's going to be dead. But anyway, in principle, you can think about such a thing, have big objects form uh, being two possible states. Uh, but that's really the, the basic idea of quantum mechanics, and that's all we're going to need for the rest of my discussion, uh, that quantum theory of Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and many others introduced a, a whole new idea that didn't exist in New the Newton's view of, or, and the subsequent classical view, as we call it, uh, of uh, physics. And the idea is the principle of superposition. 
So Newtonian mechanics, you know, each particle has a position and momentum, and then you can predict the future of the past of the universe. Uh, well, in quantum mechanics, uh, it's not as simple as that. Uh, any particle, or really anything, can be in a superposition of two more distinct states, just like the live and dead cat. And, and the canonical express experiment that really demonstrated the famous double slit experiment, where you send in electrons uh, from this source here to these two slits, and you measure them on the screen, and each blip is an electron arriving on the screen. So the electrons just do arrive you know, as a blip, one by one. Uh, but when you look at the distribution of electrons, uh, they don't look like what you'd expect if these were bullets coming through one hole or the other hole. Instead, they look like, the distribution looks like as if there were some waves coming through the two slits uh, and then interfering with each other. So a wave, you know, if you had a wave source here, you, the wave would have one part that comes through here, one that goes through here, and that would completely explain it. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not as simple as that because uh, you do see particles arriving one by one. So it seems to be both a wave and a particle. Uh, and so the way we formally say this in a more precise way okay. is, again, the idea of superposition. Uh, there are two possible states, say the left state of each electron and the right state of each electron. And the actual state of each electron uh, is some superposition or left plus right. Or there can be, of course, some complex numbers here that I've left out. Uh, but you get the basic idea, like the live and dead CAC. This is actually a real experiment uh, um, where you have the superposition of the left and the right electron. All right, so, so those, that idea, which you know, goes back, uh, I don't know, 1920s, the experiments already done in the 1920s, started to be you know, fully accepted by physicists because uh, it also gave a very successful, for the first time, description of atomic structure. Not just hydrogen, but then helium and many other atoms and molecules could be now really understood from the same basic equations. Um, but there remained many skeptics. Uh, the most famous, of course, was Einstein himself. Uh, and he wrote this paper in 1935 uh, where he asked the question, can this wonderful quantum mechanical theory actually be considered complete? Uh, and if you read the paper, the, it's clear his answer is no. Uh, although he doesn't come out and say it. He says, well, this, this is great, this theory is great, but it seems to be missing something because when we go to much larger scales, it predicts there are some rather, to him, absurd effects. So what was this famous paper of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen? What they really introduce is what we now call the concept of quantum entanglement. Uh, they didn't use that word at that time, of course. Uh, and what so they and they proposed a, what to them was a kind of an abstract thought experiment. So you take a hydrogen molecule, and from the theory of two electrons in a hydrogen molecule, uh, it was known that the electrons. I'm highly simplifying here, but the basic idea is correct. Uh, you have two electrons, one on each proton in a hydrogen molecule. And I'm just representing the state of the electron uh, with its spin that can be either up or down. So one possible state is the left electron is up and the right one is down. And the another possible state is the right is down and, uh, and uh, sorry, the left is down and the right is up. So these are two possible states of two electrons. So now we're going from one electron to two electrons. And we're now taking a superposition of two electrons. Eventually, we may want to go up to a cat, but okay, let's start simple from one to two. Uh, and so the Schrodinger's theory told us that a hydrogen molecule, the actual state, is a superposition of these two states. So EPR said, well, fine, but imagine, suppose you could buy some very clever trick, in principle this is possible, uh, separate the two electrons so that without disturbing their spin, and that's the key. Uh, so if you're not going to act on the spin of the electrons, the quantum state of the spins would not change. So this would mean that even if you uh, manage to separate the electrons and put one in Delhi and the other in Bangalore, uh, they would still be in, in a superposition state. So the actual state of these well-separated electrons would be now up-down, uh, plus down-up, it's still in the same state. 
Okay, so now this leads to some rather uncomfortable predictions. Uh, because if I look at my electron here in Delhi and I see it's down, uh, then I know for sure uh, that my partner in Bangalore uh, has uh, an electron that's up. And similarly, if I see up, then my partner has uh, an electron in Bangalore that's down. So this seems to be like somehow my measurements here are controlling what my, are instantly controlling what my friend in Bangalore sees. Uh, and so this is sometimes called spooky action at a distance. All right, well, uh, I was skeptical that Einstein ever said spooky action at a distance, uh, but I was wrong. A friend of mine in Princeton showed me this uh, letter in German written by Einstein to Bohr in 1947. Uh, here's the translation, I cannot seriously believe in it, meaning quantum mechanics, because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent the reality in time and space, free from spooky action and it is. So, well, okay. Uh, so, I mean, Einstein pointed out something that seems rather bizarre, but, and it's sometimes called a paradox, but it's not a paradox, there's no contradiction at all. That is what quantum mechanics says will happen. Uh, and uh, so we have to wait a few years, but uh, you know, now we know it does happen. There are ex these experiments are no longer thought experiments. They're done every day, millions of times. Uh, here's one report in the New York Times in 2015, um, where they entangled not two electrons, but two photons, that is quanta of light, which have both right and left polarization and separated them, in this case 1.3 kilometers, but you can do much more today, uh, and show, saw that there was indeed this entanglement. So spooky action is real. Uh, yes, okay, but I think the word spooky action is extremely misleading. It's not as if there's actually an action. There's nothing non-local about physics. Physics is local. Uh, and the key point to appreciate is that, you know, as I'm, I'm measuring my electron here to be up, uh, and I know something about my friend's electron in Bangalore, uh, and it is down, but I don't know for sure, and he does, and my friend in Bangalore doesn't know what I've done. It's only when we call up, call each other up and communicate and check what happened that we finally have exchanged some information. Before that, you know, uh, it's not, there's no information or no action really going across from me from Delhi to Bangalore. Uh, everything was local uh, because these electrons actually interacted, were close to each other in the past. Uh, that's when they got entangled and he just preserved it. Uh, so what's really non-local, and that's the heart of this, is the idea of a quantum state. You know, these two electrons share a quantum state, which is a superposition, uh, but that state doesn't belong either to this electron or that electron. Um, it's really a sort of an abstract co intermediate concept we introduce to understand the world, uh, but we just have to accept that quantum state doesn't really have any specific location associated with it. So once you accept that, then everything is local. All right. Okay, so that's the end of my introduction. Uh, I think I timed that perfectly. Uh, on four important discoveries in physics. Uh, or the microscopic encryption and entropy, uh, the discovery of superconductivity, uh, which has continued, you know, and study of superconductivity has continued to this day uh, with many open puzzles. And the other is this, you know, black holes, which now are very much, you know, out there in the universe, um, and, but just uh, having a full theory of the black hole and what's inside requires you to really think much more deeply about quantum mechanics, something that Hawking uh, started. All right, so and then I introduced some more of an abstract idea, uh, which is having a great impact on physics today. Uh, and in the remaining half, uh, part of my talk, I want to show you how uh, quantum entanglement is seems it's clear. Uh, it's clear to many people. It's the key to understanding uh, open puzzles and both superconductivity and uh, black holes. And it's somehow kind of remarkable uh, that a very similar kind of entanglement uh, seems to play a role in these very, very different objects out there.
Okay. So, so what you know, we were. I wasn't thinking about superconductivity in 1992, 93. Uh, I mean, I was. Sorry, excuse me. I was thinking very much about superconductivity. I had no idea what a black hole was. Uh, but I decided that what we really needed was a simple, very simple model. Uh, and a simple model, you know, you, you know, has to do with quantum entanglement, not just of two particles, which I've explained. Uh, the idea being to, due to EPR, uh, but of an infinite number of particles. Now, of course, we always hear about dead cat and live cat, but that's way too simple. They can be much more complicated uh, types of entanglement, uh, which are which would occur naturally in nature and perhaps in superconductors, and that's really what we want to understand. Okay, so what we needed, I felt, was some very simple model like which you could actually solve. You could write down Schrodinger's equation and solve it. And, and so that's what's called the SYK model of many particle entanglement, which uh, I know I could use. Uh, this was something uh, I came up with with my first graduate student in 1993. Uh, it was ignored for a while, but uh, a lot of people have started working on it recently, especially due to an important uh, simplification and many insights that uh, Kitev uh, gave in 2015. All right, so here I'm going to go back again historically uh, to Kekulé, to 1865. So this was, and Kekulé, uh, even though he didn't know it himself, uh, start, started the discussion of entanglement, uh, not just of two electrons, but of six electrons. Uh, so let me uh, first review what Kekulé did. Kekulé is a chemist who was thinking about the structure of benzene. So for our purposes, all you need to know is that benzene is a perfect hexagon of six carbon atoms, and there's one unbonded <coughs> electron, uh, which forms, just like a hydrogen molecule, uh, this EPR pair, this up-down minus down-up. Uh, that's going to play an important role in the rest of my talk. So, and chemists knew that some, uh, knew about valence bonds and all of these things. Uh, and so they had to come up with a solution to what this molecule benzene looked like. Uh, so one possibility was this structure shown here, uh, where each, uh, each carbon atom uh, forms a bond with, uh, with one of its neighbors. But the trouble with this possibility is that if this was actually what was happening, uh, benzene uh, would, would not be a perfect hexagon. Uh, this bond would probably become smaller than this bond, be more like a distorted hexagon. So another possibility is this one, where the bond is on the other bonds. Uh, and Kekulé said, well, it's both, uh, which is exactly what happens in quantum theory. Remember, in 1865, there was no quantum theory. He called it resonance. Today, we call it entanglement. So this is really entanglement of six electrons uh, between this state of electrons and that state of electrons. Uh, the electrons are entangled in pairs. Uh, into these bonds, uh, these ellipses, and then, then the ellipses themselves are entangled. So there's kind of a higher hierarchical level of entanglement. So, uh, so Kekulé, it says in Wikipedia, says he discovered the ring shape of the benzene molecule after having a daydream of a snake seizing its own tail. Okay, so I, I decided I had to have a dream. Uh, well, not true, but anyway. <laughs> which is, uh, imagine you have electrons on some square lattice, which is actually what the electrons do in yttrium and copper oxide. So the square lattice is very much in my mind. Uh, and then there are these snakes that go everywhere, so uh, randomly in different directions. Uh, and every time there's a snake, there's entanglement. Okay, well anyway, that pretty much sums, summarizes the SYK model. Uh, not really, but okay, here's a more precise uh, description. So I haven't put the, so you put, imagine there are locations which electrons can go. In this case, 18, 19 locations uh, where electrons could go and some fraction, there's fewer electrons than locations. Uh, and, and so the purple represent electrons which happen to sit on these sites. Okay, well, electrons will start to move around uh, even if these traps are you know, not too deep. Uh, and what the SYK model says is that don't allow electrons to move on their own. 
just restrict them to move in pairs. So for example, and you know, maybe there's some reason you could arrange that in some material to do that. And people are you know, actually doing such experiments today. Uh, but imagine, for example, the electron on site 11 and 12, these pair of electrons will move to site 5 and 14. So in quantum mechanics, for every such allowed transition, as we call it, uh, there has to be an amplitude or a complex number associated with it, uh, which you can compute from solving Schrodinger's equation in this space, if you wish. So Schrodinger's equation gives you these numbers, one number for every possible transition. So there's many other transitions, uh, uh, like this one here and so on. And every one of these transitions has to associate with a fixed uh, complex number. So Schrodinger's equation will tell you, take this list of all complex numbers, and then solve Schrodinger's equation, and it will tell you how these set of entangled electrons behave. So these, you know, because of these correlated moves, they're all getting entangled with each other, and all of these moves are happening all at the same time. Just, you know, just like this electron going to the left slit and the right slit, now it's, you know, about 10 electrons all moving at the same time, but always moving in pairs. And for each such transition, there's a fixed complex number. All right, so that's the problem. Seems easy enough, but once, you know, it's just some kind of linear equation you have to solve. The only trouble is it's impossible to solve because the number of variables in this equation grows exponentially with the number of electrons. So maybe for 20 you could do it on the best computers today, but for 100 nobody could do it because the number of states uh, grows exponentially. It's 2 to the 100 or something <coughs> like that. So you can't possibly solve this equation. And that's what you have to solve if you want to figure out how these 20 electrons entangle with each other. 10, actually. All right, so what we realized in 1993, uh, that you could solve this electron with one simple assumption, where you assume that these fixed numbers were independent random numbers, and they were you know, not very, they didn't have any special tangles, they were just random. Uh, and then we could argue that, you know, apart from a set of measure zero, where these had some very special patterns, the properties were actually self-averaging, and you could just figure out what was going on. Uh, so that was where randomness you know, became a key to simplifying uh, our understanding of many particle entanglement. Anyway, so what did we find? Well, again, uh, I can refer you to various articles, but let me just summarize in a simple set of words. <coughs> so we found that this, these electrons moving in pairs uh, look very, very different from copper. In copper, like I said earlier, the electrons can be just viewed independent of each other, just like uh, particles moving and carrying current through the wire. But here you find that the current is not carried by, uh, if you put it in a tilted potential and made these electrons flow, uh, it feeds a metal in which current is not carried by individual electrons by some entangled quantum soup. So I wish I had better words for it, but that's it. Uh, there's a bunch of equations that tell you how these uh, when these electrons are all strongly entangled, they essentially lose their identity. And we can't see them by any experiment, uh, and the current is not carried by individual electrons. Anyway, okay, so, so there's, you know, of course, many, many years of work to making this precise, uh, and I'll say a little bit about that in a few minutes. All right, so, uh, to then, I've covered a lot of different topics, so let me bring you back up to where we are for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> I told you about superconductivity and black hole, and then I introduced the idea of quantum entanglement. And then I gave you a simple solvable model of quantum entanglement. Simple, you know, looking back to it, but which uh, I discovered in 1993. Uh, and now we're going to take this model and try to make it useful. Uh, and this is what I've been doing for the past few decades. Uh, working on this model and connect, and surprisingly, to my good fortune, connecting it to uh, these two open problems that I've mentioned. So somehow it seems that even this very simple model of, a corner of electron entanglement seems to capture something about entanglement as it occurs in nature in two different situations. Okay, so let's go back to 
YBCO. So I showed you the space diagram earlier. I didn't tell you much about what the electrons are doing, uh, but let me do that now by starting in this red region here where the system is actually an insulator. It's called an AF there because if you actually look at the electrons, and in fact the important electrons that are all sitting on the square lattice of copper atoms right here, uh, and they form this configuration <coughs> where half the electrons are up and half the electrons are down. Uh, and you can measure this. So if they were all up, you would uh, be ferromagnet, just like any other magnet. But these are you know, a little more delicate, and you have to do more careful experiments to see these particular orientation of electrons. Uh, all right, so that's what's here. But now we want to change the electron density and get a theory of the strange metal in the superconductor. And actually, I'm going to say a bit more about this theory uh, on Friday, my talk on Friday evening in the physics department. For now, I'll just draw a few pictures and be done with it. So, okay, if you want to see actual equations, come Friday. Uh, anyway, so one important idea of how we should think about what happens to these electrons as you change the electron density is to go back to the Kekulé picture, really. Instead of having the electrons just in this classical looking configuration, where half of them up or half of them down, where there's no entanglement at all. Uh, imagine that they entangle in pairs, just like in Kekulé's picture of the, uh, of the benzene molecule. So again, the same uh, up-down configuration of electrons uh, in this configuration. And now, just like in benzene, there's many, many possibilities. Now, not just two, but again, an exponentially large number of possibilities. Uh, so you could imagine these electrons resonating and now we get another type of entangled state, quite different from the entangled state you get in the SYK model, uh, which people call a spin liquid. So it's another type of entangled state of really an infinite number of electrons. Uh, and the idea that this spin liquid is relevant uh, to the problem of ITC was, uh, goes back to Bhaskar and Anderson in 1987. Anyway, so you have this spin liquid state, uh, and then you remove some electron, that's the horizontal axis P, uh, and under certain conditions, what will happen is that the vacancies or the holes will form pairs and these will start moving through the lattice. Now these pairs of elect holes uh, are a type of particle called a boson that uh, Bose introduced in 1924 to understand light in a, in a black body which is also a boson, the photon is a boson, and pairs of electrons are also bosons. And Einstein pointed out that pairs of uh, both particles, not light, but other particles that are bosons could undergo uh, a phenomenon called Bose-Einstein condensation. And today we understand that to be the basic reason for superconductivity, which is the condensation of Bose particles, which are pairs of electrons. All right, so that's a very general idea. It doesn't really tell you why PC should be hard uh, and where the strange metal comes from. Uh, and so more recently, we've been studying how do you go from the spin liquid picture to the SYK picture of entanglement? How do you connect them up in some systematic way? Uh, and when you do that, you find you, you need to do that, you need to put in a few impurities like these red dots uh, and then you can get entanglement that's much more complicated. Uh, and we've shown in this recent work, published in Science, uh, led by Avish Garpatel, who's a postdoc at New York and formerly my student, uh, of how you can explain, in fact, this uh, dramatic linear resistivity and many other properties of strange metals. All right, so that was just mostly an advertisement. Uh, but telling it, so that just to summarize uh, that I've told you about two types of entanglement, multiparticle entanglement. The one in spin liquids, the one in the SYK model, and you can put them together in just the right way. It's, it seems to us that we've really started to understand this remarkable phenomenon of high temperature superconductivity. Okay, so in the last few minutes, yep, okay, I'm doing perfectly in time. I'm going to tie together the other topic. So I think it has also been clear to many. Uh, people after Hawking's work, that to understand black holes, we need to understand entanglement better, especially entanglement of large number of particles. 
Uh, and to my good fortune, it turned out that the SYK model has just the right type of entanglement to make progress in the black hole problem. So this has been a very rapidly developing field in the last 10 years, and continues to be new papers on it <laughs> uh, almost every week. Uh, but I'll give you just a sketch of it, and some of it may be a little too, so hopefully not too technical, because all pictures, uh, so you get an idea of the connection between uh, how the SYK model really captures some of the essence uh, of what's, and tells you a little bit more about what's inside the black hole. Okay, so to do that, we'll go back to uh, the famous EPR thought experiment, where you have two entangled electrons and you've separated them. But let's do the ultimate in separation, not separating them between Delhi and Bangalore, <coughs> uh, but put one inside a black hole and the other outside a black hole. Why not? Okay. <laughs> so, of course, I'm safely out here, outside the black hole, and the other electron uh, will soon be crushed to death right at the center. But while it's crossing the horizon, it doesn't feel anything untoward. There's no sign, road sign saying, stop, you're crossing the horizon. That's just like any other region of space-time in Einstein's equations. Everything looks completely normal, other than the very strong gravitational field that's put, put, pulling you inside. But nothing, you know, nothing to, to in principle, disturb the spin of the electron. Uh, so the entanglement is still there. Okay, this is still entangled with that, even though one is inside and the other is outside. Uh, and so quantum mechanics says, yeah, black hole horizon or not, uh, the inside of a black hole can be entangled with the outside of a black hole. So this is something very dramatic, uh, dramatic prediction of a quantum mechanics, because in classical theory of Einstein and Schwarzschild, nothing inside a black hole can ever influence anything outside. It's gone forever. But now there's some, at least some remnant of this, and in fact, Hawking said the black hole will eventually evaporate, and as it evaporates, what was inside will come out, and uh, the information on this qubit is not really lost forever. Anyway, so there's quantum entanglement between the inside and outside of a black hole. But over reasonable times, before the black hole is not evaporated, to, to an outside observer, the state of the electron inside the black hole cannot be known. There's nothing I can do to find this out, Classical physics prohibits me to doing that. So when I'm doing experiments out here, uh, somebody sends me this qubit, this electron, I can do experiments on it, and it can't possibly ever be connected to anything, uh, uh, to this, at least for times much longer than the age of the universe, to what's happening inside. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, this electron is totally random. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, very simple words, uh, which explains why black holes have entropy and temperature. Uh, here's another view of it. Um, really what's happening is that there are always virtual fluctuations as they are in quantum mechanics, where these EPR pairs are being created out, uh, on, the, on the horizon of a black hole. Uh, and that understanding that pair creation what, was what led Hawking to this famous formula of the entropy being equal to this expression here, which remarkably is proportional to the area of the black hole horizon. Uh, and that you can see from this picture because it's all about entanglement on the surface of a black hole. But it's also very unusual because people working in thermodynamics from the time of Clausius to the time of uh, Hawking had never ever met an object whose entropy is proportional to its area. <coughs> Every other object, including everything here, as entropy proportional to its volume. Uh, yeah. So, but here, this, entang this is an entropy not of randomness uh, in positions of molecules, it's an entropy of entanglement. It's slightly different, uh, and, but uh, it plays the same role in thermodynamics uh, as Hawking showed. All right, so that's the rough connection that was already apparent to Hawking between entanglement uh, and uh, and black hole entropy. Uh, but we still, okay, and then another interesting point, uh, let me just skip that, okay. Um, so we now have a very important question, which is I take the two famous 
two most famous formula in physics, both on two stones. <laughs> One is S is k log w, where w is the number of, uh, in quantum mechanics, w will be the number of states per unit energy interval, what we call d of e. So let's imagine Boltzmann knew quantum mechanics, and he would say S equals k log d, or another, yeah, which is the formula right here. So that's what uh, uh, Boltzmann would say. And the other famous formula on a group gravestone uh, is right here, of Stephen Orkey, uh, which gives you a temperature and also the entropy. He should have really put the entropy here. You know, that would make a much nicer comparison, but he didn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> it's this formula here. Maybe I should just put it myself. Yeah, this formula there. Imagine that was on Hawking gravestone. So we now, now we have these two famous formulas in physics. Are they compatible with each other? Uh, and we don't really know for sure exactly how, uh, because to understand then uh, Hawking's formula in terms of Boltzmann's formula, I have to tell you, I have to give you some quantum, I would describe a quantum system and actually measure its quantum states and compute and count them and show that the density of the quantum states is just right to give you Hawking's entry. <coughs> now, no one's ever really done, done that for the black holes we have out in our universe. But for simpler type of black holes, it has been done. And the answer is yes, they're in agreement. Uh, and it was first done by Stromer and Waffa for a very special type of black hole, which had a special feature called supersymmetry. Uh, which doesn't really exist in our universe. So anyway, for these supersymmetric black holes, they show it to get compatibility with, uh, between the two gravestones. But they, had, but they found something very peculiar, which surely is not right for any black hole in our universe, uh, which is that all the states uh, in this supersymmetric black hole uh, had the same energy. This is a delta fountain, for those of you who know what it is. Uh, they had exactly the same energy. That's totally unphysical, and no black hole would ever have such a property. <coughs> OK, so now let me conclude by showing you how the SYK model has given us a quantum system in certain simple cases where you can actually count the D of E. And again, it agrees with Hawking's formula. Uh, and also gives you corrections to Hawking's formula. So it turns out you can do this for a very special type of black holes. Uh, black holes would have a net charge. Uh, they either positively or negatively charged, which is probably impossible, probably un very unlikely out there, or black holes that are rotating very fast. I'll talk about the charge case because it's simpler. Uh, the rotating black hole was actually something worked out by Sandeep Trivedi and his colleagues at TIFR. So if I take a black hole with a net charge, uh, it turns out Einstein's theory tells you something very special. Uh, it tells you that the radial direction, which I call zeta, can be described without worrying about the angular direction, which I call x. So what you need is then a theory of quantum gravity along this one direction to understand you know, what's inside this strange black hole. Uh, and so, so that one spatial dimension black uh, theory will describe entanglement <laughs> at this point. And what is the model that turns out to describe the entanglement in this one space and one time dimension theory? Uh, well, okay, it turns out to be precisely the SYK model. Uh, and so viewed from the outside, a charged black hole looks as if uh, there's a bunch of SYK models uh, on the surface of the black hole. Uh, and what's happening inside, well, you can imagine that there's actually not a singularity, but some very quantum soup of entangled particles. Now, I'm not actually saying there's actually an SYK model, it's just that it has just the right properties to, uh, on, to, to give you the Hawking and expression and its corrections. And the details of exactly which model you take don't really matter in the end. Uh, something you can read about more in these and many other articles. OK, so, so in particular, uh, this is, well, <coughs> sorry for the complicated formula. There's an expression for the density of states of the SYK model as we defined it. And from this expression, now we have, through the work of many people, a very precise expression for the density of states of a charged black hole. 
um, which has all these strange formula in it. This is the Hawking result, and this and this all came about in relatively recent work. All right, so I'm done. Let me just recap uh, the basic ideas. Um, so yes, I've said this many times. Quantum entanglement had many faces, uh, and one of its faces is in the SYK model, and that seems to be key to understanding superconductivity and basic properties of black holes. Uh, yeah, so it is the kind of entanglement where there's total loss of identity of the particles. Uh, and in one set of variables, this is crucial to describing the strange electrical properties of IBCO. And in what's called a dual set of variables, it describes the interior um, of charred black holes. So, thank you. <laughs>
yes, so obviously I didn't explain any of that here. Maybe let's not. Uh, but that is kind of what I was trying to get across in this, these slides here, uh, that once you put in a few impurities, uh, the spin liquid entanglement can give way to entanglement that's more like SYK model. Uh, there's a lot, you know, I think in my talk on Friday, I'll say definitely a bit more about that. But what's driving it, as you correctly said, is the exchange interaction. Anyway, questions, any, anybody from, quest questions from young students, please. Maybe There's someone, one. somebody from Neil Gurry House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sir, uh, Hello. Uh, sir, uh, that uh, Hawking's uh, entropy equation, yeah. uh, we talked about that being consistent with, uh, in accordance to the statistical uh, mechanics equation of Boseman. Uh, yeah. where the weight of configuration changes to something like density of states. Yes. Uh, in your uh, SYK model, yeah. since the uh, we're talking about some finite amount of uh, uh, states, can I use some concept of weight of configurations to calculate entropy and that be consistent with the yes, Hawking's equation? Yes, absolutely. That is exactly what I showed very quickly in these two slides. So this formula here has been computed. This is the density of states of a number of uh, states per unit energy interval. These are the actual states from a numerical diagonalization. Uh, this formula, well, you can read about it in this review of the modern physics article, where it came from. Uh, so this is what we computed and many other people. And then through these connections with charged black holes and this two-dimensional gravity, uh, you could then compute this formula. Uh, and this formula here is not, you know, take the log of D of E, you get, this is the most important expression, you get the, uh, the Hawking formula. But today we can go well beyond Hawking. Okay. We have all these other terms here that give you quantum corrections to Hawking's result. <coughs> so Hawking's result, you know, was, was the leading approximation for a large black hole. And now we can even correct it. That, you know, that doesn't have any simple interpretation because it's really even going beyond Boltzmann. Yeah. Thank you, sir. There's one more small uh, doubt. Can we uh, have somebody else, if somebody else has, has any other question? <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, the basic question. Uh, the electron uh, in the superconductor, yes. if two electrons are independent, the behavior is like conductor. I mean, Correct. There is, there is a scattering, right? It's, a, it's in what I call an ordinary metal. Yeah. Ordinary. I want to distinguish an ordinary metal from a strange metal. Yeah. yeah. So, and when they are coupled, I mean, they form the uh, upper pairs, the yeah. scattering gets reduced so, uh, I mean, dramatically. So how, uh, and so the, that's why uh, there is no scattering and so it continue to uh, flow the charges. So yeah. why this happens? Right, so uh, yeah, I mean I think the short answer is we don't know. But we're starting to understand this. And what the message I'm trying to get across is that when you're in the strange metal, then the entanglement of these electrons, the right word is entanglement or correlation, <laughs> The entanglement of these electrons uh, is sort of like the SYK model. That's uh, okay, uh, which I've already described. But as you cool down, then there's a transformation, and at some point it's more like a spin liquid, uh, and then there's also both condensation happening. Uh, so there's all these very different phenomena all happening at the same time, which are all having to do with the change in pattern of entanglement. And you know, and that ultimately at its heart is why we have such a difficult problem. You know, today the ultimate problem we'd like to solve is tell you the value of this temperature. Why is it 100 Kelvin? We, we are nowhere near solving that problem. But to solve that problem, we have to do all of this. We have to. We are starting to see the pieces of it. Which we have to go from somehow from uh, a strange uh, the SYK like type entanglement to spin liquid entanglement, and then with the onset of Bose condensation at some temperature, uh, you get superconductivity, yeah. So uh, I'll give you some ideas, I've said this all so Come to my talk on Friday, you'll, I'll tell you a bit more about those ideas. <laughs> Maybe we could have one more question at most, one more question. I think the experts can leave it to Friday. 
how much time it will take uh, uh, between two entanglements? Like uh, you have to use you saw one electron uh, inside the black hole and one is outside. Uh, yeah. Uh, how much time it will take to change the uh, uh, information between two electrons? Suppose uh, if I want to send information, then electromagnetic wave uh, changes in one second and uh, it, 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 it goes in speed of light. So how much time it will take uh, to change the uh, information between two entanglements? Okay, well, certainly to actually change the entanglement, uh, there is the, nothing can be faster than the speed of light, no question about that. It's not faster than that. You're going to change the entanglement. One thing, but one thing I would, I want to emphasize, which perhaps is behind your question, uh, is when I'm drawing these pictures of these electrons, you know, doing all these things. This is one thing, one thing. There's not, there's no real time here. All of that is happening together. <laughs> there's a state which involves, which is a superposition of all of these different configurations. It's a, unlike the double slit, which is a superposition of two states which both went together, this is a superposition of 2 to the n states. And if there's 100 electrons, that's 2 to the 100, which is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's a huge superposition. So it is not faster than the speed of light. There, there's no time. It's all in this. It's a superposition of all of those states together. Okay. I think it's, uh, we'll have to close here. I'm sure there are other questions. Uh, maybe Professor Sajdev could answer a few of them outside when we are having tea. So, uh, on that note, uh, we will thank uh, Professor Sajdev in the usual way.